Hello, and welcome again to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. This time we're going to talk about building cloud native applications with Spring Boot on OpenShift. Um, and we have Thomas Quartzstrom, um, who's one of our JBoss gurus, here to talk to us about that. I'm going to let him introduce himself and his topic. Uh, we'll have live Q&A at the end. If you have questions, ask them in the chat. Um, and the slides to this will be posted on the blog.openshift.org site um, uh, in about a couple of days. It's, it's taking a little while to get them up there. So, Thomas, without any further ado, please, um, and thank you for taking over um, and taking this slot. Oh, thank you very much. So, uh, as Diane said, my name is Thomas, and I work as a JBoss technology evangelist. And I'm going to talk today about Spring Boot and how, how Spring Boot can run best on OpenShift. But before that, we're going to dive into some other questions. So this is this is probably the question of the century sometimes. Uh, well, cloud native actually has many different uh, definitions, and cloud native will, will the definition of cloud native will vary depending on who you ask. So before we dive into what cloud native, what I think cloud native is, I want to consider what's been happening in the IT industry leading up to this term a bit. So. Traditionally, applications have been encouraged to include lots of functionality, including user interface, various services, code to access data, and, and more in a single application, and, and that's regardless of technology stack used. I'm going to use monolith as the term to describe these applications in this session. And considering, for example, an e-commerce application, if built as a monolith, it generally includes all functionality for handling the web user interface product catalogs, shopping catalogs, product recommendations, product ratings, reviews, payment system, and everything else that is needed to make a purchase in the e-commerce website. And it's all in one single application, if that's a monolith. And majority of the existing applications today are built as a monolith and deployed on traditional application servers. These application servers are generally designed not only to service the application itself, but also include many operational features to host and manage multiple mon monolithic applications at once and an administer the life cycle. Uh, for example, deploy and undeploy them and manage deployment history for applications, manage and sync configuration, etc., which all resulted uh, in these application servers being heavy and resource intensive. However, software development and how we architecture and host application has evolved. So if we start with the software development process, we've seen involvement from waterfall type of development where we spend months on planning and defining requirements to agile development to DevOps. And at the same time, on the infrastructure, we've seen involvement from big complex data centers to hosted solution and to hybrid cloud solutions. And finally, uh, the software architecture has also evolved to, uh, to the latest and very popular architecture style called microservices. So looking at the software development process from a business driver uh, and the business drivers behind it, uh, this, uh, uh, the, involvement, uh, 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 the involvement comes from speed and agility. And the same is true for involvement in infrastructure, where we're moving from physical to virtual to cloud and containing, having, reducing the lead times uh, from months to get a server and to seconds to get a container up and running. Additionally, microservice allows for faster time to market with small incremental changes. And to me, cloud native app is, is that is exactly that, uh, build, that building new application using the latest of these trends and latest of these architecture process and, and, and uh, infrastructure and uh, having that support. There are others that, that define cloud native applications differently using, for example, 12 factor applications as a template. However, I don't necessarily share the view that an application has to be stateless to be cloud native. It just have to manage the state slightly different than the monolithic applications. So, but for now, let's focus on, uh, on the architecture a bit about, and about adopting microservices. So, with the emergency of cloud, people wanted to take these applications to the cloud environment and in order to take advantage of the on-demand compute capacity. However, application servers are usually not a good fit for such an environment and may become a blocker. 
Shifting to cloud, many of the administrative capability are provided by the cloud platforms that are not required anymore from the application servers. Also, from an architectural standpoint, in a microservices architecture, you want to break out each of the services into their own deployments. Each of these microservices are managed and deployed independently and possibly uh, by different teams, um, making responsibility for the life cycle all the way from, uh, from, from requirement to production. In order to break out these services, in addition to define correct boundaries, you need to define the correct boundaries. And, um, but you also need to think about a, a couple of more things. So, in going through microservices, you'll, you'll uh, and an ease a way to describe this a bit easier. So let's say you, and let's say you refactored your uh, your application to a microservices architecture. You will need some type of runtime to run your services. Um, Regardless if that's a fat bootable jar or some kind of runtime, you will need a runtime to run your applications on top of that. But in order to, to operate that service, you also need a set of microservices capabilities, uh, to how to build it, how to manage it, how to monitoring, etc. Uh, and we're going, talking, uh, we're going to talk more about microservices capabilities later. But first, let's see what microservices runtime may look like and discuss, we'll discuss what alternative successful organizations have been using in order to, produ to productive, be productive in microservices. So here are some of, of the most popular runtimes. Um, and probably you're familiar with some of them. So Node.js is, is, uh, is known for its ecosystem, uh, it, that it's lightweight, and also since it's based uh, on JavaScript. So if you're a fan of JavaScript, you're probably uh, looking into doing uh, parts of your, or at least parts of your microservices with your Node.js. An alternative might actually be Vertex. Vertex is a multi-language reactive framework that supports not only JavaScript and Java and other languages, but it's it's um, but it's known to be a reactive framework and a very very good, very very good. Uh, but it requires a new set of mindset to develop reactive applications uh, compared to building and uh, the traditional type of applications. Uh, we have we also have Wildfly Swarm, uh, which is a bootable, just enough Java EE runtime for you to use your application. Great if you're already knowledgeable about Java EE and that's your preferred platform. So you might want to look into Wildfly Swarm uh, for that. And finally, Spring Boot, which is where it's the focus of today's session we're going to talk. Um, so let's focus more on Spring Boot. And Spring is a very popular development framework that's been uh, that that's um, uh, used to be deployed typically on an application server. However, the introduction of cloud native and and small projects with a, a, a very small pro a little, a little, very little project within the Spring community started to get traction, and that project was Spring Boot. And um, uh, Spring Boot, together with an op opinionated approach on how to build microservices, made it very popular amongst uh, the early adopters uh, of microservices. Just like early versions of Spring Boot had an opinionated view of which components to use, Red Hat are looking into offering support for many of the community products that Red Hat drive and participate in. For example, of those communities are Tomcat, Hibernate, Apache CXF, Red Hat Single Sign-On, also known also known as Keycloak, and finally a set of Kubernetes adoptions for Spring Boot for Spring Framework, should say. Um, Red Hat also we plan to add more technologies of this as we move forward. Um, this is planned to be supported by Red Hat OpenShift application runtime uh, by, uh, and supported in an application called Red Hat application, uh, uh, OpenShift application runtimes. And, uh, and, that's, and, and we will support Spring uh, together with other runtimes, the other runtimes that we discussed, like you Node.js, know, Vertex, and Wildfly Swarm. And if you want to hear more about that, I suggest that you listen in to Jean John Klingen's talk that will provide much more detail about the OpenShift application runtime. So let's let's move move over to a demo actually and see how Spring Boot looks like. So if you've never seen Spring Boot, you might enjoy this demo. But it's a very simplistic demo on how to get started with Spring. So 
Spring has a, an, a website called start.spring.io, which is called Spring Initializer as well, which allows you to bootstrap your applications. So you basically just provide a, a group name. We're going to stick with common example here. You, you can change the artifact. We're gonna, I'm going to call this greeting. And, and then we can add different uh, dependencies. And these dependencies are, are what we call the opinionated type of dependencies. If you do web here, you get full stack web development with Tomcat and Spring MVC. So that's fine. So let's, let's do that. Let's generate that project. So, so now what I can do is I can unzip that downloaded archive. And voila, I got my, my Maven project. So let's go into. Oh, greetings and greeting project here. Um, the greeting project, we can open it up in a code editor. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code Editor, which uh, I find a very, very nice, uh, easy to get started type of, of uh, editor that is easy to do quick editing in. So as you can see, we got a, the, the, we got a, a good um, a good uh, example of a good project here. We got uh, uh, already got an um, application oops, that will will Spring that will use Spring Boot to bootstrap our our and use uh, that in Spring Boot to start our runtime, and we can now start adding more and more functionality in here. So I'm gonna add um, a new class in here which we're going to call uh, uh, hello control. So hello controller, actually. So I'm going to do hello controller.java. And since you probably don't want to see me type all the time, I'm going to do some copy and paste here. I fix one little thing. And here I got my hello uh, controller and my hello controller is kind of simplistic. It's using a REST interface uh, and it will find out which host name it's actually running on. Either it's looking for an environment variable named host name or it's going to show you unknown. And and then it's uh, upon the request to slash, which is kind of the, the, the root or exception of our calls, it's going to return greetings from Spring Boot uh, from and the host name. So kind of simplistic. So let's let's try that out. So all we should have to do is to do Maven package here. Oh, it helps if I actually save the file as well. So I'm going to redo that. Maven package. And now, um, what should have happened now is we we, we we what happened is that we got a jar file called greetings. It's not snapchat.jar number and snapshot.jar. So we can immediately test that by doing Java minus jar and go to target and do greetings 001.snapshot.jar. So let's try that locally and see what happens. So you can see my My Spring application is starting, and uh, uh, we, um, if I go to the browser, I can go to localhost 8080, and it should return greetings from Spring Boot. Let's do that a bit bigger. Greetings from Spring Boot from my my computer, which has this name host name. So that's kind of simplistic and kind of nice, but uh, but it's that's how easy it is to get started with a Spring Boot project. So uh, let's move on in the presentation for now. So <clears throat> that's a possible way to do runtime, and it's a, a so Spring Boot is is, a, is one potential way to do your microservices runtime. Uh, which is easy to use. There's a lot of the good examples out there. There's a lot of uh, know-how and, and sharing and knowledge around the, the community about this. But run, uh, runtime is not enough. We also need the microservices capabilities, uh, like we talked about before. And so to understand what the microservices capabilities is, we might have to go back at times. So let's, let's consider the Java microservices platform at 2014, approximately. This was before we had containerized, uh, well, the containerized that we know today, the ecosystem around containers that we know today. Uh, um, and 
And the, the common way to do uh, isolation between processes for actually using virtual servers. So um, a good example of this is Netflix. So Netflix, where, 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 uh, when they're building their uh, original architecture, it was based on the infrastructure as a service running on Amazon. And for, for each service, they deployed on, on, on different virtual servers out there or, 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 no, or nodes in the Amazon cluster. So that is good, but it's it's kind of low level though. It's it's we 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 don't really have any benefit from, except from the infrastructure as a service providing us compute, storage, and 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 network. We don't really have any additional ways of how to do uh, load balancing, failover, etc. So we need a bunch of other uh, another services, infrastructure services here. So that's how Netflix uh, came up with a lot of really really good and great. Uh, 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 projects to to tackle those kind of problems that we have with microservices based on an infrastructure as a service. So that includes, for example, Eureka, which is a service registry that, that clients are doing lookup to to find the service location. And it, it's in a sense a service discovery. Uh, and then you have the configuration server to external, externalize configuration. You have Ribbon to do client-side load balancing. You have Hystrix as a circuit breaker. Sipkin to do distributed tracing. And Sool as the smart proxy uh, purely based on Java in there. And these are all very, very nice. But it means that you have a lot of these infrastructure services that you also have to deploy within your with your application. <clears throat> so that's... Uh, Going back to the current state and when we the, the tools and and uh, tools we have today, especially looking at something like OpenShift and deploying Spring uh, Spring Boot application on OpenShift, they, we don't have to have that. So, um, so because Red Hat OpenShift is a complete container application platform that natively integrates technologies like Docker and Kubernetes and provides a common platform for developers to build and manage and containerized application in a self-service fashion. It's built on top of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, and uh, it's the trusted enterprise operating system, which is used by 90% of the Fortune 500 companies. And it provides tools and services for building container images and source code and application binaries and managing their life cycle in a production scale. Redis is a leader both in the Kubernetes and Docker community, and is a top contributor to both communities to making make sure these technologies fit smoothly to the needs of our customers and building microservices on top of OpenShift. And specifically for microservices, OpenShift provides a large set of capabilities to take complexity out of the building and running distributed systems at, at scale. It provides a service discovery. It provides routing and load balancing to be able to send traffic to microservices and control how traffic gets distributed between multiple instances and enabling patterns like A-B testing, etc. You have metrics and monitoring to make sure you can identify anomalies. And, and configuration and secrets management to decouple environment-specific data from the microservices. Uh, finally, we have central centralized logging, uh, service isolation, etc. So OpenShift uh, is the only platform in the market that provides multi-tenancy on top of Kubernetes and allows all teams and developers to work and collaborate on that. So the nice thing about that is we, we, there is less thing we need to do to actually uh, to provide that type of infrastructure. I'm going to come back to that first, but let's let's consider a demo where we want to do uh, deploy now on top of, of OpenShift. So let's go back to our application that we developed. We have here. I'm going to break out of the of that running instance that we had. Now, if I reload, you can see that I, there is nothing on my host. So what we're going to do now is we're going to turn this into uh, to a, uh, we're going to use a, a plugin called Fabric 8 that will help us uh, help us and add to this project so that we can we can deploy it immediately in OpenShift. So before that, let's check that the current POM we have does not only have the currently have the Spring Boot uh, Maven plugin, but if I run this command, which is uh, uh, this is the group ID, IO, Fabric 8, and then you have Fabric 8 Maven plugin, the version number, and then uh, an instruction called setup. And if I run that in the project, it will 
add the fabric the maven plugin and, and a set of sensible defaults for us so that we can quickly deploy this and build this into uh, into uh, OpenShift. So I have an OpenShift instance running locally here, and I have currently in there I have a project that is empty; it doesn't have anything in it. So we don't we don't have any any builds, and there's nothing in this project currently. So by going to by going to our project right now, and we we're gonna issue a command and tell Fabric 8 our plugin we just installed, Fabric 8 deploy and by issuing that command we are gonna start a build of the project and which is gonna start on send basically takes our existing jar application that that's that bootable jar application it sends it up to openshift openshift takes that and, and runs it through the S source to image process where it creates an uh, container image uh, out of this uh, out of this yar file so we have a container image run uh, that is now a, capable of running and it will automatically create a service for us and and a route as well so all of a sudden we have our application deployed here and we can you can see we can now see greet is from spring boot from and then we have the container name here the container name matches the pod name here in here so you can see the pod name in here that's quite easy and, and and that's that's really really powerful because if we want to scale this up uh, and because of the isolation we don't have to worry about port conflicts and other things all we can do is just scale this up and, and say that i want more instances of these and because the the, the ha load balancer in in openshift default uses a, a stickiness i will only see the same server here if i reload uh, but you'll have to trust me that we actually have failover. So if I, what I can do is I can actually start, I can do like this. I can do open in an incognito window. And now you can see that compared to that one, we have another host name here now. I hope that's readable and can make it a bit bigger. So, oh, um, with that, I'm going to go back to the slides. So uh, I talked briefly about Spring Cloud Kubernetes. And Spring Cloud Kubernetes is actually uh, where Red Hat is, is, help, is providing uh, to the Spring community uh, adaptation to make Spring Cloud and Spring, uh, Spring and Spring Cloud work better on, on Kubernetes. So since OpenShift is based on Kubernetes, that's an, an effort that will improve how Spring can run on, on top of, of OpenShift. So taking that to a bit of a uh, bit of uh, uh, taking that a bit further. So for example, service discovery. So by providing a service discovery is something that's automatically in OpenShift, by, but by providing a, a, a Spring discovery client, uh, you, it, it it, you know, people don't have to change the code, anything uh, going from a, another environment over to OpenShift. They can still use the, the lookup, even though the lookup will basically just query the, the Kubernetes uh, services and, and then this, uh, they actually load map, uh, the, the round robbing and uh, sort of load balancing is actually happening in the OpenShift layer. But it makes it seamless to move from OpenShift or to another type of uh, deployment infrastructure for Spring. Uh, type of applications. Uh, same thing is the configuration maps hooks into the configuration properties and Spring property source. So you can use the Spring property and Spring, Spring configuration uh, to, uh, to read Kubernetes config maps values. So that could include environment variables. It could include other configuration things like secrets that we, we need to have. Um, you have a ribbon, ribbon service discovery. We have Sipkin service discovery. And we also have configuration management with, with Orsion in there. Orsios, I guess it's it's. So let's talk a bit about the evolution of of microservices. So I, I talked briefly about this that 2014, the the <laughs> we had uh, the way to do uh, microservices was basically providing on top of an infrastructure as a service, provide a set of infrastructure services that included distributed tracing, smart ride routing, API management, message messaging, cache, SSO, configuration services, and, and, and service registry. 
And then on top of that, we provide business logic that is actually tainted with some infrastructure logic as well. So in the business logic, we still have some some bis, some uh, some uh, some infrastructure logic. For example, uh, that that is common that you client side load balancing. Um, service registration, circuit breaking pattern, distributed tracing. This is, these are all part of your service that you are deploying on top of that infrastructure and that cloud provider. So currently using something like OpenShift, a lot of the infrastructure services, some of the infrastructure services I can say can be moved down into the, to the cloud layer. So configuration uh, with config maps, for example, service side load balancing and service registry is already in there. Uh, it can also help automate the deployment of certain infrastructure services, but we still a, a certain amount of infrastructure services we, we still need currently. So that, that still includes distributed tracing, smart routing, API management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And and we can we can remove some of the the pro, the problematic things in uh, in having infrastructure logic in our business logic, but we still potentially need circuit breaker and we might still need distributed tracing logics in our actual built application in the yard that we deploy. In the future, we envision that together with OpenShift, together with Istio, it will uh, it will remove the need for having that type of business logic in that in your application, the infrastructure uh, logic in your business logic layer. You, your business logic can focus on being exactly your business logic. It doesn't have to care about circuit breaker, distributed tracing, etc. Instead, we can move that type of functionality into Istio. So that's where we envision the forward going. And this is regardless of which platform we're talking about. This this should be the same for Spring. It, sh it should be Spring Boot. It should be the same for Wildfire Swarm. It should be the same for Vertex and, and Node.js, etc. So that's uh, that's our vision going forward. And with that, I'm going to end for today, but we're going to have a bit of q and I guess. Uh, we'll, so see. Diane, yeah. <laughs> we'll see if we have Q&A. Um, we have a number of people that are on, but I think um, you've done a pretty good job answering most of the questions um, that people have had um, already. And uh, since I'm a Python person, I don't have a lot of Spring Boot Java questions um, up my sleeve. So um, we'll see. We'll give everybody a few minutes to see if anyone has a question. Um, and if not, where is um, the best place for people to um, reach out to you and get more information? So uh, the best place to reach out to me is is probably uh, through Twitter. Uh, my handle is T T Kvarnst, <laughs> which is an abbreviation of my first name and my last name. So that's T Q V A R N S T. Uh, or you can uh, you can uh, email me as well on T Kvarnst at redat.com. Is is there a place where some of this information is um, in the OpenShift docs already? Y uh, so we are since, since most of the information in here are actually going to be part of what we, we release as the, the OpenShift application runtimes, uh, and, and and maybe I should mention that uh, the OpenShift application runtime will will reach the market as a beta in uh, around uh, Java one. So that's when we expect to publish much more on this on developers.redout.com, but also on on www.redout.com. Uh, where we'll have documentations and other things as well. So, so this is really, um, this is really fresh off the presses. Um, yes. <laughs> um, that's why we're doing all these intro courses, and we'll we'll have John Klingen back um, when things settle down and um, do the intro bit. So look for that video too. That should be coming up soon. I'm looking to see if anyone has any questions in the chat, um, or if anyone has anything to add. If not, um, we thank you all for um, coming. There's quite a lot of people considering the quick shift that we did at the beginning of this, so I really appreciate your patience with our process. And um, we'll get this video and the slides up on the OpenShift blog this week. So, um, or actually Monday morning, probably. It'll probably take me the weekend to process all this. So thanks again um, for your patience, and um, we will work um, our magic and get this and the slides out to you. And as soon as the beta is out, we'll just keep doing more um, Red Hat application runtime talks um, until we've um, covered all of the bases. So thanks again, Thomas, for stepping up. And uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you very much.
Thank you for having me.